Friends, I welcome you to my channel. Before listening to this story, I will ask you to subscribe and put a thumbs up. It is not difficult for you, and I am pleased. And here we go. Randy Baker was found dead in the hallway of his Colorado home. The soup he had bought just minutes before had spilled all over the floor. It seemed the 59-year-old man's ailing heart had finally taken over. I just got home, opened the door, and my husband is dead on the floor. A terrified Kelly Baker, his wife, can be heard telling a police dispatcher around 8.30 a.m. A coroner's investigator arrived shortly afterward and initially believed Randy died of natural causes because Randy had a heart condition, but an autopsy soon determined that two bullets were lodged in Baker's body. Note, how it happened that the coroner did not immediately notice the traces of blood is unclear to the author, but that's what the papers said and we'll leave it at that. There were other disturbing signs at the scene. Randy's wallet, keys, and his car, a Pontiac, were also gone. Randy's death was a homicide, but who would wish death on a recovering heart patient? His wife, Kelly, initially suggested to detectives that her husband's former past as a drug dealer might have motivated someone to kill the reformed substance abuse counselor. But investigators soon discovered that Randy's killers were much closer to home. Randy's life changed forever when he was just 28 years old and was electrocuted while working as an electrician for a local power company. Randy suffered permanent damage to his heart and was in so much pain that he found himself turning to drugs. There was so much pain, and he didn't know what to do about it, his ex-wife, Dory Baker, told Dateline reporter Keith Morrison of the dark years that followed. As Randy fell deeper and deeper into drugs and alcohol, he began dealing drugs. But after three years of addiction and substance abuse, Randy cleaned up his life and became sober. He dedicated himself to helping others and became a dedicated drug and alcohol counselor even helping his own nephew Raisley battle addiction. My dear uncle, you were not only a role model and inspiration to me, but also the closest person I've ever had as a real father. He wrote to Randy in a Father's Day message in 2015. Later in the story, we'll learn more about what Raisley actually did. When Randy's life got back on track, he fell for a lusty hairdresser named Kelly. Randy soon began sleeping with his new acquaintance, Kelly. His wife, Dory, soon found out about it. And after that, his marriage to Dory fell apart. Randy and Kelly were soon married. For years, it seemed that Randy and Kelly were happy together. But as Randy's health continued to decline, Kelly found herself taking on more of a caregiver and nurse role. In the spring of 2017, Kelly announced that she had had enough and moved out of the house she was living in with Randy. She later told police detectives that she was pushed to the limit when she left Randy because Randy was just a little mean. She also told detectives that Randy had two life insurance policies totaling only $10,000. But there was one question asked by detectives that Kelly initially refused to answer, whether she was seeing anyone else at the time of the murder. After detectives were persistent, she admitted that she had been having an affair with another man. The man also admitted to the affair, but also told police that he had been with Kelly the night Randy was killed. Two months earlier, early Sunday morning, Kelly, Randy's wife, was in bed with her lover, Jerry Swifton. Jerry was 10 years younger than Kelly, a charming middle-aged man. She met him when she visited a neighboring town, 100 kilometers from Randy's house where she used to live. Jerry was a fun, outgoing, kind guy. Except he had one big flaw, from Kelly's point of view. Jerry was poor. That was something the mercurial Kelly couldn't stand. She had tried several times to encourage Jerry to change jobs or try to get more money, but Jerry wasn't interested. Kelly, darling, Jerry turned to her, warmed by her skillful oral caresses. When are you going to divorce that old man Randy of yours and marry me? Mmm, Kelly mumbled as her mouth was busy looking up at Jerry from below. Then she released his male organ from her mouth and raised her head. You know, darling, she replied. After all, the house and the car and the money, almost everything belongs to that old donkey Randy. In a divorce, I'd get almost nothing, and I'd be left with nothing and that's after I took care of him like a nurse for almost ten years, and he doesn't appreciate it at all. But there must be something you can do, Jerry said, stroking Kelly's hair affectionately. Hire lawyers, Jerry continued. They'll twist him like a rag, you'll see. Yeah, Kelly grumbled. But in order to hire lawyers, you have to have money, and I don't have any. That cheapskate Randy keeps his checkbook to himself and won't give it to me. Jerry lay relaxed on his back, and Kelly lay on top of him resting her voluminous breasts on top of him. Kelly stopped moving, leaned closer to Jerry's ear, and spoke to him in a whisper. Listen, Jerry, 
You have a gun, don't you? You use it to hunt deer and pheasants, right? That's right, Jerry confirmed. So what? He really was an avid hunter. Jerry loved to hunt and fish. He spent a lot of time outdoors. First of all, he enjoyed hunting. And secondly, it saved him money. After all, to shoot and carve a deer or catch fish himself was more pleasant and cheaper for him than to buy ready-made meat and fish in the store. So shoot that old fart Randy, Kelly whispered hotly in his ear. Do something useful with your gun. Besides, Kelly added in a whisper, Randy has an insurance policy, life insurance. If anything happens to him, I'll get the money from his policy. Her eyes sparkled. She wanted to solve her problem by someone else's hand so she wouldn't have to do it herself. You're crazy, Jerry said indignantly. He didn't know whether she was joking or serious. Okay, I was kidding, Kelly tried to cover the awkwardness. Let's just keep making love. And she began to jump on top of Jerry with redoubled vigor, so that he quickly forgot about their conversation, engrossed in the hot lovemaking. What a sissy that Jerry is, Kelly thought to herself as she lay next to him in bed after some hot bedtime foreplay. Also looks so manly and muscular on the outside but inside he's like a wimp. I'll have to do it all myself. No, when I get rid of my husband, I'll have to find another lover. The day after the incident, there were three people sitting at the farthest table in a small cafe. Kelly, Randy Baker's wife, Carol, Randy's sister, and Raisley, who was Carol's son. These three had one thing in common, their shared dislike for Randy Baker. Kelly and Carol, longtime childhood friends, met often, and each time they met, they would rant about poor Randy, washing his bones, talking about what a miser and a bore Randy was. This time, they were no longer engaged in idle discussion of Randy's character. They were preparing a plan. The two women who organized the case had to be away from the crime scene and have ironclad alibis, and his nephew Raisley would kill Randy and make it look like an accident, or like a random robbery. In return, the devious women promised Raisley that he would get a Harley Davidson. Randy's brand new motorcycle and $10,000 when the whole thing was over. Raisley was hesitant at first, but when they promised him the motorcycle, he agreed. He had wanted a motorcycle like this for a long time. After careful preparation, having talked over all the details, the two women and Randy's nephew set about executing the plan. The most important clue to the mystery, at first in the first days after the murder, investigators thought they had no leads to pursue and the case could remain one of the unsolved cases. Investigators got the break they needed when, five days after Randy's murder, his Pontiac car was found abandoned in a South Greeley alley, wiped down, with the license plate removed. Randy's old belongings and his empty wallet were found in the car. Detectives learned that the car had been listed for sale on social media, and eventually learned after interviewing a number of professional criminals and stolen car resellers that Randy's own sister, Carol Baker, was the one who sold the car. They discovered that the relationship between Randy and his older sister had been strained for years, but that Carol had developed a close friendship with his wife, Kelly. Investigators questioned Vinny, the eldest daughter of slain Randy Baker, about it. It was kind of a standoff between Kelly and Carol and my dad, and it became more and more noticeable after we kids grew up and left home, his daughter Vinny recalled. After learning of the unusually close relationship between Kelly and Carol, Detective Mike Prill began an in-depth study of both women's phones and discovered that the women exchanged about 4,500 text messages over the spring and summer of that year. The phone records confirmed that there was a simmering hatred for Randy between these two women, Investigator Prill said. However, both women had ironclad alibis for the time of Randy's murder. Prill finally put the pieces of the murder together when he discovered a text message from Carol Kelly instructing her to put a number on her phone under the name Sonia that actually belonged to Risley, the same relative who once thanked Randy for being a supportive father. The investigator found out that Raisley, who was Carol Baker's son, had a sordid gang-related past and had already served a lengthy prison sentence. Putting the pieces together, investigators determined that the trio had been planning Randy's murder for months, and Carol herself confirmed this theory during police questioning. According to Carol, Kelly was the mastermind behind the murder and wanted Randy dead because she believed he would never leave her alone. But that wasn't her only motive. Detectives also discovered that instead of a meager $10,000 life insurance proceeds, Kelly actually inherited more than $130,000 in life insurance along with the house where she and Randy had previously lived. 
After seven months behind bars, Risley, known by the nickname Grizz, after striking a deal with prosecutors that removed the death penalty, confessed to his involvement in Randy's murder in exchange for his testimony against the slain man's wife, Kelly Baker. Raisley insisted that Randy was a great man and claimed that Carol and Kelly manipulated him into shooting Randy in exchange for $10,000 and Randy's favorite motorcycle, a Harley Davidson. However, when Randy testified in court, he refused to retell the story he told investigators about how the three men planned the murder. Nevertheless, even without his testimony, Kelly was found guilty of murdering her husband and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Kelly Baker was a very charming and cunning woman. She had a remarkable ability to speak in a way that was credible to everyone. At trial, Kelly denied involvement in her husband's murder. When she was called for cross-examination at the trial, she answered and held herself in such a way that the jury at first almost sympathized with her. Her feminine charm and credibility were her main weapons. At the end of the questioning, the prosecutor asked Kelly the most important questions that decided the outcome of the case. Is it true that before he came home, your husband sent you a text saying he was bringing home a dollar four hundred fifty paycheck from work? Yes, Kelly Baker replied. Is it correct that Randy's wallet was found empty in his car after the car was discovered? Yes, replied the defendant. Is it true that you did not see your husband again that day, were not at home and did not touch his car? Yes, she answered in the same manner. Is it true that you deposited his check for dollar four hundred fifty in your bank account that same day? Yes, answered the defendant. Then how can you explain how his check came into your possession that day? The defendant did not answer. Thank you, Your Honor. The prosecutor addressed the judge. I have no further questions for the defendant. We met the real Kelly Baker. What became clear to us is that she is a manipulator. Anthea Carrasco, Deputy Chief District Attorney for Weld County, told the television program Dateline Secrets Revealed. Raisley received the same sentence and the slain man's sister, Carol Baker, received 30 years behind bars for her role in her younger brother's murder. The convictions have brought his daughter Vinny some relief, but she still mourns the father who was once her man. This situation made me feel like I had no control over anything in my life. My father was the only person who pretended that I could control my life. But now I can't call him to see if I'm doing well, she said. Thank you for listening to my heartwarming story. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss out on heartwarming stories. And I also have a second channel where you will also find interesting life stories. I will leave the link in the description.